בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם. We're back to uh, Wednesday night, סתם the rabbi. We have a, ברוך השם, some בשורות טובות, some good news. Uh, to uh, publicize, uh, hopefully you guys have some questions too. Have some chidushim. Zod Hashem. Lots to do. Uh, tonight, uh, the shiur will be for Ilui Nishmat Basha Batchana, and also for a uh, Refua Shlema for Yitro Ben Avraham, Levana Bat Sara, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora, Chaim Sholem Dovber Ben uh, Dvora Rut, um, Esther Bat Zipora, Serach Bat Batya, Batya Bat Sara, and Elisheva Chaya Bat Sara, Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam, Ve'et Kol Am Yisrael, Refuat HaNefesh, Refuat HaGuf. So, <coughs> a few things, uh, just uh, some updates. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we got another order of uh, the uh, cards that uh, I keep telling you about. These things, I think, have been a very uh, big hit so far. So um, we made a few small revisions uh, on the cards, these movie cards, where there's actually a designated website just for the movie. It's Hashem um, took back his millions, dot com, dot org. Both of them work, Baruch Hashem. One of the tzaddikim from uh, from the from England made the website Ashav uh, Ashachetko. So uh, the movie is just uh, a place. Just uh, the uh, website is just for the movie. So we use that. So a person, whether they you they know what to do with the QR code or they don't, they'll still go to the website and they'll be Ezot Hashem watch the movie. And uh, this movie is a the number one tool that we have. Uh, to help people get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu simply because, you know, when you uh, hear a speaker, within a matter of a few minutes, sometimes less, sometimes more, but within a matter of a few minutes, you decide whether you, what your opinion is about this person, whether you like him, whether you continue to listen to him, you find him boring, you find him this, you find him that. And it's very, very important that people... Um, watch the movie as the first introduction to our shiurim because before a person is going to decide whether they're going to listen to the guidance that we're going to give them or not, they have to decide whether they can connect to us in the first place. So the movie gives them a couple of main things. Number one, it gives them an understanding that uh, they're not alone with their problems, whatever their problem may be, whether it's a money issue or it's a health problem or it's uh, intermarriage, or it's uh, in all types of uh, desires, money, uh, 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 success, things of that nature. Baruch Hashem, the story covers quite a few grounds, and everyone connects to the movie. Anyone that's watched the movie completely, Baruch Hashem has given us fantastic feedback. Many people have actually done tshuva through it, uh, probably more than anything else, aside from the Pekama Brit Shurim that we've done over the years. Uh, but, uh, Baruch Hashem, this is a, a tool where a person is going to get uh, a very clear understanding that he's not alone. She's not alone with their circumstance. But the second thing they're going to get is they're going to decide whether we are the vessel that they can use to get to the emit. You know, they'll, just, they'll determine an opinion about us. Uh, most of the time, Baruch Hashem, it's good. Sometimes uh, they, they care less for it. So, either way, before you invest any time into guiding people personally, into sending them shiurim and so on, you have to decide, am I the vessel? So the movie is the best way to do that. So lots of people ask me all the time, oh, can you talk to this one, can you talk to that one? My friend, my brother, my mother, my father, my this one, my that one. And the strategy is constantly is, okay, first, before I talk to anybody, let them watch the movie. Once they watch the movie, it's going to tell me a few things. Number one, if they've identified their issue within the movie, most of the time they do. Second thing is whether I'm the vessel, whether they uh, connect to it and they uh, are going to take the guidance that we'll give them. And three, which is probably more important than the first two, whether they're actually looking for a solution to their problem. 
And how do I know if they're looking for a solution for their problem? If they're willing to sit there for an hour and a half to learn, then they're looking for a solution for their problem. But if they're not even willing to sit there and learn and watch a movie that's so entertaining but educational at the same time for an hour and a half, that means they're not looking for a solution. They're looking for an excuse. And they're not looking to invest into themselves, then there's no reason for us to invest in them. So the best thing for a person to do is, uh, is to make sure that as many people as possible watch this movie. Baruch Hashem on Facebook, we've had over three quarters of a million hits on this movie on uh, YouTube. Another few hundred thousand, I think would maybe around a quarter million. So Baruch Hashem, the movie has gotten to quite a few people. But this is only a small fraction of what we need to do. So as happy as we are about so what we what a Kadosh Baruch Hu has blessed us with already, the ambition to uh, for kedusha, the ambition for to help Am Yisrael, the uh, the ambition to get a Kadosh Baruch Hu's children closer to him, can never be satiated. So you have to constantly shoot for more. So this movie card has been a, a pretty good success. It's a uh, cost effective that only ten cents. And uh, you can put them everywhere. You can convince your local Jewish supermarket to put it in every bag. You could uh, put a few of them in the, uh, you know, different uh, Judaica stores and so on and so forth. You could also do what some of the tzaddikim are doing, which is simply putting it either in people's hands directly or they're uh, putting it in their mailboxes. They're putting it in their house next to their, uh, their handle of their door. Once a person sees this, it piques their interest and in Bezat Hashem, they watch the movie. And uh, this, for anyone who wants to order, they go to the website and uh, they could uh, order, uh, you know, a few hundred, uh, 500 or more for themselves, for others, and so on. Uh, we're not taking any, less, any orders less than 500 simply because, number one, it's only $50. Uh, number two, it just takes too much time. We're not Amazon. You know, it takes too much time to create a package and put everything together for uh, 25 of them. Uh, so uh, if you want to give out uh, 500 or more, order it on the, um, on the website. I think it's cheap enough where everyone could afford it. If you still can't afford even that, then just contact us and let us know. And we'll send it to you anyway. But um, that's one. Number two, after almost two years of working on this project, Baruch Hashem, uh, the, uh, and then waiting for the order, and then delays, and then problems, and then Ishtabach Shimo, and then all the good things that have been happening over the last couple of years. Baruch Hashem, the order of a couple of hundred thousand CDs, DVDs of the Pekama Brit uh, are here. It's a double CD DVD. One is a CD that, uh, similar to other stuff, it's always been two CDs at a time. One is an audio CD for about 60 shiurim that we've done, both long and short, about tikkun abrit, b'gam abrit, wasting seed, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this, Baruch Hashem, this topic has uh, not been covered in the English language more than what we've done, Baruch Hashem. So this is a big uh, schut from Shemaim that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us to uh, discuss this issue with so many hundreds and hundreds of people on a weekly basis over the years and have helped more people do tshuva, learn Torah, and even some cases turn into Tamidei Chachamim uh, in a relatively short period of time after they fix this issue. So uh, these uh, 60 or so shiurim are in one side. If you listen to the CD, there's simply no way that you're going to be as inclined to make the sin as you are without listening to it. Now, it's not a, uh, you know, a, uh, a magic pill where if you listen to it, you're guaranteed to never sin again. But the point is, is that once a person has learned enough about this sin, they're supposed to, at the very least, get to a point of being scared. And most importantly, if they continue to learn these things on a, on a regular basis, they eventually arrive at the conclusion that the sin itself is disgusting. And the one, two, three, four, five seconds of joy are not worth the, the disgust and the consequence that will happen beyond the disgust for making this crime. Now, the other side of this double CD DVD is the movies. And it's not only this movie uh, of the personal story, but about eight other movies, short movies uh, that we've made over the years that... Uh, the team has made Baruch Hashem about Shabbat, about all different types of things, motivational movies 
that uh, have been very successful. So a person that has this you know, even if he's embarrassed to pick up the CD because he doesn't want to let people know because, you know, people have things in their imagination. They think that everyone's paying attention to what they pick up and what they don't. Uh, in reality, no one cares. But uh, anyway, the beauty is that we made it this way, that, uh, you know, you don't have to uh, pick it up because of the tikkun abrit, even though that's what you really need. You pick it up because you uh, want to watch the movie because both of them are on the same CD and they're both on the package. So this is one of the most important things that I think has hit the English world, for sure, the most important thing that we've done, uh, simply because this does not exist. Now, if we came out with a Tikkun Abrit CD or movie or whatever it is in Hebrew, I'd say it's important, but not as important. Why not as important? Because it exists. In Hebrew, there's several Chachamim already that over the years have talked about the subject extensively, have made movies about it, have made lectures about it, and so on and so forth. So, Baruch Hashem, anyone that's looking to, to become Kadosh can find this. But in English, it's simply unheard of. There is literally less than a handful of rabbis that have talked about it at all. Uh... Uh, Rabbi Elon Nava, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi uh, Mizrahi, uh, Rabbi Zitron, uh, and probably a couple of others that I can't remember. Uh, and uh, also, actually, a uh, new friend of mine that uh, I met recently, he actually did a shiur about it himself, uh, the um, uh, accidental Talmudist. He actually has about a half hour, 40 minutes shiur about this because it was part of the Gemara Masechet Shabbat. And he's learning the Shas and he's making shiurim about it. So he made a shiur about it recently. Uh, so the point is, is that out of a hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of English-speaking teachers in the Jewish religion, when you literally have uh, half a dozen people talking about the subject altogether, you already see the tragedy. Especially when the Shulchan Aruch calls this sin the worst sin in the entire Torah. You know, if it was just another sin, okay, then, you know, maybe people don't like it, it's this, it's not politically correct, it's not PG. But here you have, a Shulchan Aruch calls something the worst thing in the world, and no one's talking about it almost, relatively speaking. But then when you find out even worse that out of the handful of speakers that have spoken about it, 95% of the shulim are what we've done over the last couple of years. So if, let's say, there is, let's say, uh, you know, uh, 75, 80 shulim in the world, we did 70 of them, 65 of them. That's, that's the situation that we stand in, Rabotai. And although we appreciate the merit but we also understand the danger that we're in because the Shulchan Aruch says that a person like this is making the worst sin in the world. The Gemara says that a person like this is bringing the flood. The Zohar Kadosh says that if a person wants to do tshuva for Pagam Abrit, Hashem is not going to help him. He has to do it on his own. And the, the uh, Rashid Chochmah Masechet Geinom says that a person that weighs seed and does not do tshuva, en lo chelek le'olam abba. Marah says the same thing, and everywhere else says the same thing. It's not just Rishish Bomah. person that wastes seed and does not do tshuva has no share of the world to come. They go to Gehenom, and they stay there. This is a very, very serious problem. Now, interestingly enough, you know, we had a lot of Yetzirah interference to make this uh, CD, put it together, even though the, the lectures themselves existed. But, uh, Baruch Hashem, you know, the... Uh, when we finally got everything done with all the mistakes and all the issues and so on, you had coronavirus. Coronavirus happened. So now the factories are shut down and everything is shut down. And no, no, no. Now, what was, what, what's the interesting, what's the uh, chidush? If you notice, about two months ago, a little less than two months ago, China pretty much announced that coronavirus is no longer a problem. They're going back to normal. And China right now, more or less, is back to normal. Uh, the factories are back on. The, uh, everything is back on. You know, if you want to order something from China, you'll get it. Like, 
like nothing happened, because there's no corona. Even if they may or may not be lying about the numbers and the sick people, bottom line is the economy back there is back to practically full force. The day they announced this, the factory sent us, the same day, they sent us to the CD, it went on the ship. When they released the cure, HaKadosh Baruch released the disease. Now, someone could say it's a coincidence. We don't believe in coincidences. What we do believe in is that there's a cure in these, in these teachings. A cure that's very much needed. Now, if the couple of hundred thousand CDs stay in my warehouse, no one's going to do tshuva. Why? People don't do tshuva when CDs are in the warehouse. If I wait for all of the generous people to order them and pay for it, no one's going to do tshuva. Why? We don't have that uh, bracha on people ordering CDs. Out of the half a million plus CDs that we've uh, given out over the last few years, I think maybe we sold about a thousand or two. The rest of them are given for free. Why are they given for free? Because the people that want the CDs either don't have money or don't want to pay. And the people that want to pay don't have the time to give out the CDs or don't have the ability. So what do we do? Mix and match. We try to find sponsors for people to get the CDs. But that's when you're dealing with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 at a clip. Right now we have a couple hundred thousand. If we do it at a, uh, with the, you know, each guy tells me, oh, listen, I want 200, I want 300, I want 500. Mashiach will come 10 times and we're not going to finish with this. And the reality is we need to order another few million of these CDs. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do some type of a uh, uh, plan that Be'ezrat Hashem will work to try to do a distribution all in a short period of time, maybe even one day. Uh, but that would mean we'll most likely we'll have to uh, focus on one, maybe two areas and just distribute it in one particular Jewish community, Jewish city, and so on. If somebody wants special order for themselves, then obviously you have to order. It's online. I think it's on the website already. You could order it. That's not a problem. But as far as the large quantities, the five, you know, the thousands and so on, that we need to distribute as soon as possible. We're just trying to figure out what's the fastest way to do it. Uh, because uh, the, the CD sitting in the warehouse is not going to do anyone any good. And uh, we have to do our Ishtadlut and our Mesirut Nefesh in order to try to bring more blessing to Am Yisrael as soon as possible. So when Shulchan Aruch says that something is the worst sin in the world, and you have an entire two, maybe even three generations of Jews that do not even know it's a sin, bechlal. some even think it's a mitzvah, then you have yourself a very serious problem. You have to do whatever you can to fix. And if, when you have the cure, and you're a human being still, you're not going to say, listen, can you pay for this? Oh, you can't pay for it? Okay, go die. Go die. Maybe your friend has some money. I'll wait for him. You can't do that. You have the cure. You have to send it out. So, Bezat Hashem, we're going to be sending them out uh, as, soon, uh, you know, as soon as we get uh, some things together. But anyone that wants, again, to, to order specific smaller quantities, you go to the website, order them. But uh, our plan is to try to give these out as soon as possible. Baruch Hashem. And Bezat Hashem. So, anyway... Now, we have a uh, situation now that um, we have a generation of people that do not know about this crime that HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls Pekam uh, Many people do not think it's a sin. Some people think it's a sin but not such a big deal. You know, like a, uh, a guy takes money out of the company's petty cash account. You know, some companies, I don't know if they still do it anymore today, uh, but uh, he uses the company's petty cash. Sometimes it's there's a little box in the office. If you need something to buy for the office or something like that, you use the money from this cash and you give it back or you tell people that you have it. But he decided to go Take this money, the couple of thousand dollars in his box, got tight, go, go shopping. But, you know, he felt bad. He wanted to take the whole 2,000, so, you know, he took 500. And he came back and he put 100 back, and then he took 300 more, and, you know, he started using it in his own personal bank account. 
So guy, so it's not so bad. Now, if he's a decent employee, high-level employee, it says, listen, you're stupid, but we're not going to fire you for this because you make us a lot more money than what you took from us, the couple of thousand dollars. That's what people think sometimes with, when it comes to they think it's like taking money from the petty cash. What is it really like? It's like going into the company, breaking into the system, taking all of the company's customers, copying them, taking all of the company's cash, transferring it to your personal account, and then using some of that money to hire some assassins and kill everybody. All the witnesses. So no one can come to you complaining. That's Gamabrit, in so many words. So the difference between petty cash and what we just said, Shamayim Varetz. So how come we have so many people, at least two, maybe three generations of people, that are completely clueless to this sin? Many times it's because they do not learn this in yeshivot. They do not learn this in the English-speaking books, English-language books. There's very few books written about this. And even if there are, they're not exactly on the most popular list. You're not going to see them as number one recommended on any of the publishing houses, whether it be Feldheim or Art Scroll or Morznaim or any of these companies. They're all wonderful companies, but you're not going to. They don't have any Gamabrit books. Where are you going to find these few books that are written in English about this topic? Maybe you're going to get something from Breslev if you if the Hasid knows you and he knows you're a young guy and he gives you one of these things because he knows Tikkun Abri is a big deal and you don't know it's a big deal, so he gives it to you. Or you go to some other website and then something looks kind of, oh, well, there's fire on it. I want to get some fire. You don't really know what this book is about. It's at the end of the website, the 37th page of the search. Let me buy this one. I'm already buying 10 books. I'm not going to read anyway. Let's add this one. So that's where the book, it's hidden somewhere. Why? The Satan works very, very hard to put the wool over your eyes, to keep it away from everyone, which in essence is the reason why, or at least one of the reasons why, we have to push so hard to keep speaking about it. But unfortunately, one of the other reasons is that the Satan also has employees. And those employees are called Erev Rav. Now the Erev Rav, don't mistake and think that the Erev Rav are only Zionists. Heretics that, you know, uh, don't believe in God. Some of them believe in Christianity. Some of them don't believe in God at all. But nonetheless, all of them are against Judaism. That's not only Erev Rav. That is Erev Rav, but there's others. Last night after the shiur we did in uh, Aventura, I went home we did another shiur. In Hebrew, because we had a uh, we had a uh, crowd in uh, Eretz Israel that's been asking for a shiul, so we did another shiul last night. We talked about this topic of some of the original Zionists and what they wrote and said with their own words, where Herzl's plan to solve the Jewish problem they call it, which is in essence allowing the Jews or not allowing them to exist. His answer was answered in his communication with the Pope and the Pope's employees. What was the answer? Convert all Jews to Catholicism. That was Herzl. That was his plan. Ben-Gurion, when he was asked, you know, if you can save all of the Jews, but they were all going to go to England, save them from the Holocaust, but they're all going to go to England, or half the Jews are going to go to Eretz Israel. What do you prefer? Ben Gurion says, surely I would pick the half a million that will go to Eretz Israel. Meaning, if they're not coming to Eretz Israel, let them die. Let three million die. Let kiss. Human life doesn't make a difference. What makes a difference? We succeed. So we get a name. We make ourselves a name. Like Dora Palaga, the uh, Tower of Babel generation, right after Noah. They wanted to make a tower to make themselves a name. That's what the Zionists are. Another one of the uh, heretics over there in, in Zionism said, anyone that thinks that Zionism and Judaism are the same is simply either a fool or they're lying to themselves. 
what Zionism is, is a something that is destroys Judaism. That's what it is. We're not trying to start a, or have a continuation of Judaism or even something similar, but rather something completely new. Where he says that the place where Judaism ends, Zionism begins. These are the Zionists. Now, this is clearly, you read some of these things, what they wrote in them, themselves with their own words, what they said on the radio. Now, obviously, you don't have to be a genius. This is obviously Erev Now, the Zionists of today are not quite the same. Some are really bad, but most of them are not the same. Most of them are just clueless about even their own uh, heroes. Most, I, I myself went to college in Binghamton University, and I took a class of Zionism. They gave us a, a book about Zionism, maybe like uh, 11 or 1,300 pages. Giant book. You had to read the whole thing, and every class would review certain parts of the book and so on. And I promise you that none of what I just said, none of it, was mentioned in that book. The way they portray Herzl and Ben-Gurion and Weizmann and all of these people, these are heroes. The fact that they were more anti-Semitic than the Nazis, they don't mention that part. It's no surprise, no surprise at all, that Eichmann, Imach Shimo Vezichro, the Nazi, that was responsible to killing millions of Jews, he himself wrote in a letter that if he wasn't a Nazi, he would be a Zionist. So when a person looks at this real, honest information, says, yeah, it's Erev Rav, right? Okay, but what about now? That's not only Erev. Erev Rav has different parts. As Rav Wasserman, Allah Shalom, said Erev Rav and Amalek are the same seed. Amalek is the Nazis. Erev Rav is Jews. Erev, Kav, Erev Rav comes in different forms. And sometimes Erev Rav comes in a form of a religious Jew. Sometimes Erev Rav comes in a form of a secular Jew. Sometimes Erev Rav is a rabbi. Sometimes Erev Rav is Talmud. Erev Rav comes in different ways. Now, the Chafetz Chaim, Allah Shalom, everyone knows his work, the Mishnah Brura, all the Alachot, the Sefer Lashon Ara, the Chafetz Chaim. Everyone knows this work much more after he died than while he was alive. But throughout his life, everyone knew he was a tzaddik. When he was around 90 years old, Someone asked him a question. He answered and he said to him, Look at my teeth. And the young man looked at his teeth. He said, See, I'm not missing a single tooth. 90 years old, 90 plus years old, not missing a single tooth. He says, You know why? Because in my entire life, I never said one thing that's forbidden. Never said Lashonara one time. Never Rechilut one time. Never. If we could last a week without it, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think our teeth will grow back. Never in his whole life. But yet, everyone knows these fantastic stories about the Chafetz Chaim. But what most people don't know is that the Chafetz Chaim, every single day, throughout the vast majority of his life, from the time that he got his dot, that he understood, Every single day of his life, for 90 plus years, he cursed a person, a Jew, by the name of Adam Cohen. Every day he would say, Adam Cohen, imach shimo. Adam Cohen, imach shimo v'zichro. Every day. Chafetz Chaim never said one thing that's forbidden. Kodesh Kodeshim has Talmidim like the Rav Wasserman. His Talmid is Gdolado. Avgodinsky, I mean, uh, giants. Cursing a Jew every day for 90 years. So one time the Talmudim asked him, Rabbi, who's this? Why, why do you curse this Adam Cohen? Miskin, whatever. 
getting cursed from Ish Kadosh. Imagine you're a person, you say something, uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu makes it happen. So Chafetz Chaim tells them, I was an orphan. When I was an orphan, the uh, woman that adopted him, nice person, and when he was, you know, she would give him some certain freedom. He would learn, he would do this, he would do that. And, you know, as a young kid, he was a talented kid. And a guy looks like a religious Jew, goes to Beknesset, puts on tefillin, looks modest, peot, beard, everything. So this young kid is very talented. Smart kid, you could talk to him and he understands what you're talking about. So he started spending time with him. Now, little Israel Meir, the Chafetz Chaim, you know, he's looking for a father figure. He doesn't have a father. So he's looking for a father figure. So he started, uh, you know, spending time with him. And he would tell him, you know, you know, you, you know you're learning the Torah, it's good, you know, it's nice, but don't make uh, such a big deal out of it. You know, these sages, they're wrong sometimes. Huh? Sages are wrong sometimes? Yeah, you know, the sages, you know, they're old. It's a long time ago. Things changed. Things changed, no? Oh. And a young kid would listen to these things that were the opposite of what he would learn in, in, in the book, was the opposite of what he would learn from his Rebbe. But Adam Cohen told him this guy was an older man, a uh, very... Uh, sophisticated looking person well known one day one of the neighbors person with Yirat Shammai noticed that this Adam Cohen keeps coming keeps coming keeps coming and he's spending a lot of time with the uh, little Israel Meir and he tells the mother he goes no 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 don't let him spend any time with this guy this guy is a Rasha Merusha why no he's religious no he's not a Christian what are you talking about no, no, this guy is a Rasha. I know him. I know him personally. He's one of the reformers. He's like Mendelssohn. They look religious. They act religious. They go to shul. They do all the things on the exterior. But they have constant kfira come out of their mouth. They want a new Torah. Get the kid away from him. Long story short, they, moved, they had to move away to run away from this person. And when the Chafetz Chaim, as a young boy, finally got to an age where he started understanding what this Adam Cohen was telling him, and he realized what he was trying to do to him. From that moment on, for the rest of his life, every single day, he would curse him. Imach Shimo Adam Cohen. Adam Cohen Imach Shimo. Every day. Why? Tried to murder my Neshama, the Chafetz Chaim says. Not murder of the body. Murder of the body, big deal. You go to Olam Abba, Gan Eden, Moshe Rabbeinu, Avraham Avinu. What's the problem? Murder the Neshama. Nothing worse than that. So sometimes, Rabotai Karim, the person does not realize that a Erev Rav can come to you in, in different forms and sizes. It doesn't necessarily always have to come in a way of a uh, the obvious, the Christian missionary, uh, the uh, secular atheist, the Zionist, anti-Torah type of person. Sometimes it comes to you in a form of uh, something that actually looks quite familiar. Now, before we go into questions, just to understand this specific issue, does anybody know who was more righteous than David Melech after David Melech? It's a trick question. Nobody. David Melech, Mashiach comes from him. Akadosh Baruch Hu said, David Melech, I have Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David. To carry the Shechina, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David. David was Kodesh Kodashim. One of the reasons why the heads of the Sanhedrin 
themselves hated him. Hated him. Became Doegadomi. They became a lost his Allah Abba because of this. Why? They were jealous of David. Why are they jealous? Allah Khaki David. Anything David says, that's what Kadosh Bahu is thinking. That's it. That's Allah. What he said, that's the Allah. What David decided, what he said, that's Allah. He's always right. Always. Never said one thing from his from his mouth, and it wasn't Allah. Kodesh Kodashim surely understood the Ilkhot Lashonara. Surely understood Avat Israel. But here he writes in Tehilim 139. In verse number 21, Alo misan echa Adonai esna, ubitkomimecha et kotat. For indeed, those who hate you, O Hashem, I hate them, and I quarrel with those who rise up against you. With the utmost hatred, I hate them, they have become enemies to me. David Melech, Kodesh Kodeshim, the Mashiach, Mashiach Israel, it says a Kadosh Baruch Hu. There are certain people, they hate you. So you know what? I hate them. But not only do I hate them, they're my enemies. Who's he talking about? Who is he thinking about? We're talking about uh who are you talking about? Saddam Hussein? Talk about Hitler? You don't need a verse in the Torah to do that. We know you hate Hitler. We know you hate Saddam Hussein. You know, David Amelech, people that hate you, I not only hate them, but they're my enemies. You know, because hate, you hate somebody sometimes, but after a while it cools off. You know, he calls you, says, All right, listen, what's up, what's going on? You pretend like nothing happened because yeah, it's not worth it anymore. So hate sometimes, after a while, it goes away. You hate her today, six months later, you miss her, oh, I love you, I love you, do, 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 you know, eh, no big deal. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, hate goes away. It's good. But no, no, David Amalek says, no, no, now I hate them. They're my enemy. Enemies don't go away. Person's your enemy, doesn't go away. David Amalek says, Akadosh Baruch Hu, these people that hate you, I not only hate them, they're my enemy. It's my life's mission to go fight them. To go fight these people. I quarrel with them. I'm not going to leave them alone. If I know who they are, I'm going to go fight them. Who are these people? David the Melech is talking about people that are mesitim. People that cause Jewish people to get further from Hashem. People that work for the Satan. People that we also call the Erev Rav. That's who's he talking about. Because Rabotai Karim, David Amelech understood fully well that someone that's a sinner sins by himself, sins with a female, she sins with a male, violates Shabbat, whatever you're doing on your own time, it's not good. Not good at all. You're going to get yourself into genom. But that doesn't make you an enemy right away, by default. What makes you an enemy by default? One time you did it, you're an enemy. Until you fix it. Causing somebody else to do that. Causing somebody else to violate Shabbat. Causing somebody else to go against Hashem. If you notice... The Amidah is well known as Tfilat Shmona Esre, the 18 prayers, 18 blessings. But if you count them, it's 19. It's not 18. It's called Tfilat Shmona Esre, the 18 pra- blessings, 18 prayers, but it really has 19. Why has 19? Originally it had 18, but then there was a bunch of Amalek, Amaleks, Erev Rav, Missionaries started off as Jews and eventually became Christians. Pretended to be Jews. Try to convince Ami said to go worship Yoshke. 
started convincing people. Why? Because back then it wasn't such a noticeable difference. People wore the same clothes. They looked the same. They said similar things. They spoke the same language. It's very hard to tell the difference between the Jews and the Christians back then. Because all of the Jews that started Christianity, they're all Jews. They're all Jews. The people were Jews. No, no, no. We, we have a new leader. No, no. He's just a rabbi. Later on, tell him, no, we think he's God. So the reality is, Rabotai, this created such a big problem that the sages instituted a new addition to the prayer. Alaminim v'alam al shinim was added to the prayer. A special prayer to ask and plead with Hashem to destroy all of the people that are steering Am Israel away from Hashem. Hashem, all of these people that are minim, that they believe in uh, Christianity, they believe they, they call themselves Messianic Jews, or they believe in some type of idolatry, or they, these people, in addition to that, if they cause other people to get away from you, Hashem, also, if they report on the Jews, you know, one Jew has a difficulty with another Jew, instead of going to Bedin, he goes to the Memshala, he goes to the government, calls the cops on him. Very serious problem. Since those people, Kadosh Baruch we need your help to destroy them. Destroy them from the world. And that was instituted as the 19th prayer. Interestingly, this current virus is called COVID-19. Rabbi Mizrahi says, surely it's not a coincidence that 19 and 19. There's a lot of minim in this generation. A lot of malshinim in this generation. A lot of mesitim in this generation. So, now a person thinking, okay, these people are terrible people to get people away from Hashem. But what is this really? In the end of that blessing, it says that all of the enemies of Hashem may be destroyed. But there is another nusach in some Sidurim that Arav Shach used to use. Arav Shach says all of the people that are enemies of your nation may be destroyed, not enemies of yours, Hashem. So even though it was accepted to actually have what the common Nusach is, which is all of the enemies of Hashem should be destroyed, Rav Shach, one of the G'dolei Adol, would use the, a different Nusach and say, no, only the enemies of Hashem should be destroyed. Only the enemies of your nation should be destroyed. Not the enemies of Hashem. So they asked for the Rav, how come you're using this? He says, because if you understood how easy it is to become an enemy of Hashem, you would also change. You know how easy it is? Your friend says, listen, I'm going to Shiel Torah. You want to come? Nah, don't go. Come, we're going to have pizza at my house. We're going to watch a game. You're an enemy of Hashem. At that moment, you're an enemy of Hashem. Why? The guy was going to learn Torah, and now you're convincing him to go eat pizza. That makes you an enemy of Hashem. Very scary. Why? Most of us have been enemies of Hashem at some point of our life. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Why? Guy told you, listen, uh, you, you want to go to this uh, rabbi, we're going to get a blessing, we're going to maybe get a chizuk, something. Nah, why are you going? Why are you going? For what? You believe in that stuff? You're going to buy that stuff? You really believe that stuff? Nah, come on, let's go to the beach. Let's go to the beach. Go to a club. Meet some girls, boys, this, that. A couple of drinks. That's a life. Enemy of Hashem. Enemy of Hashem. David Melech says, those people, I fight them. I hate them. I hate those people. Rabbi makes a shoe. Says something that you don't like to hear. Why? Because you're, it's about you. Rabbi says that someone violates Shabbat is considered an idol worshiper. Rabbi says that if you're Pogim Brit and don't do Tshuva, you go to Gainon permanently. Rabbi says that the wig on your wife's head is from Abu Dazara. What do you do? Write a comment. Ah, we call this guy a stupid, idiot, don't listen to his stuff. 
he's not even this, he's not even that, he's only about tshuva. I don't even know if he knows how to read, I don't know if he knows how to write, I don't even know if it's him speaking, maybe it's a robot, I don't know, maybe he's really this. Nah, eh. That comment? Enemy Bashem. Why? What's the point of the comment? The point of the comment is to get other people not to watch. That's the point of the comment. The point of the comment is to insult the rabbi that said something that it's in accordance with the Torah. He's not saying something that's against the Torah. He's saying something that's in the Torah. And you're saying to people, no, no, don't, don't listen to this guy. He's fanatic. He's fanatic. Enemy of Hashem. David Melech has your name in his sidu. He says, him, I fight him. From Shemaim. I hate him. He's an enemy of Hashem. Why? He tries to get people away from Hashem. And Rav Shach says, that's how easy it is to become an enemy of Hashem. In so many words, don't talk. If it's not supporting the Torah, supporting Chachamim, don't speak. At all. Be quiet, like mute. Maybe people don't even know if you're talking, eventually. If it's not Divrei Chochmah, don't speak. That's how easy it is to become an enemy of Hashem. So now, you have yourself the greats among us. Tell us that you have to be very, very careful of such people. But then you have certain people that call themselves rabbis that tell people, no, no, come on, wasting seed, the sin, all of these punishments, that's not for this generation. What do you think? Hashem's going to kill everyone. Practically, everybody wastes seed now, so there's no way that Hashem is going to destroy everyone. That's Amalek. That's Erev Rav. Enemy of Hashem. Why? You may, when a person says that any one of the mitzvot is no longer relevant to this generation, they have violated the Torah in several ways. First and foremost, they changed the Torah. And one of our 13 principles of faith is that the Torah will never change. There is no this generation, that generation. The second your rabbi, your speaker, your buddy, your whoever told you that this sin is no longer relevant to this generation, enemy of Hashem. You believe him, you're an enemy of Hashem too. And so a person has to use their mind now. Okay, I don't want to become an enemy of Hashem. So how do I get my head to understand that this guy that looks like a really good rabbi and he speaks really well, how do I get, I know he's a kufir though, but how do I get my, my mind to stay at that focus to know that don't go back, don't go back, don't go back. Pay attention to this. And then we'll start with questions. If you notice, these people that are really undercover enemies of Hashem, but they tell people things that people like to hear, like, no, everything's okay, everyone's a Tinok Shanishba, everyone's a captured baby, they don't know, everyone has a share of the world to come. These rabbis shouldn't speak against them. Fear tactic. Don't scare people. That's not good. So who are they rebuking? They're rebuking the rabbis. The few of us that are actually telling people what Torah says about punishment, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says about going against them, the few of us, they speak against us. During the Pittsburgh massacre, when we told people that to call these, 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 these apikorsim, they were in a reform shul doing a brit milah for a uh, baby of a uh, gay couple. To call them uh, dying on Kiddush Hashem was complete heresy, complete shtuyot. One of these clowns that calls themselves a chassid and an orthodox rabbi said that anyone that said that is considered is Amalek. Why? These people are Jews. They died because they're Jews. They died on Kiddush Hashem. What's interesting about this? Anyone have thought about this? When it comes to the rabbis that rebuke and tell the emet, he gives them on the head. Why are you rebuking Am Yisrael? 
Why? Have kav zchut for Am Yisrael. Have kav zchut for Am Yisrael. So against the rabbis, the Talmidei Chachamim, the ones that are quoting the Torah, the ones that are following the Torah, the ones that their whole life is Torah. No, one time they make uh, something, say something you don't like, it's not your shita, it's not your way. It's not wrong, it's just not your way. Ah, you guys are bad, you guys are Erev Rav, you guys are Amalek. But the Reshaim Arurim that have the homosexuality parties, that, that are violating Shabbat, that are Ovdeh Abu Dazara, no, the Tinokot Shinishbu, give them Kav Shot. Why don't you understand them? They're good people. Wait, hold on a second. If you're going to be critical, why aren't you critical of everyone? How come you're critical on the ones that are righteous and are following the Torah, but the ones that are wicked, clearly, kafzchut. Give them benefit of the doubt. How come? If you're going to give kafzchut, why don't you give both them kafzchut? If you're going to be critical, be critical on both. What does that show? Rabbeinu Yonah says someone that agrees with the Rasha is a bigger Rasha himself. And he takes it from the Radak, who takes it from the Torah itself. If you agree with the Rasha, you compliment the Rasha, you're a bigger Rasha than he is. And what you'll notice is that these rabbis that call everyone a Tinok Shanishba, everyone is a, 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 you know, captured baby, they don't know right, they don't know left, they always say, no, he's... Yeah, but he's a rasha. He's, he, he knows he's not allowed to drive on Shabbat. But he drives to shul every week. Yeah, but, you know, he grew up different. He grew up in this. He grew up there. He grew up in New York. He grew up in Gainom. grew up in Kafakela. You know, he's grew up in all these different places. He doesn't know, you know. So you give him, give him some benefit of that. Eventually, he's going to get do tshuva. What do you mean? He's been driving to shul for 20 years. Yeah, I know, eventually. He's 75 years old. What, what do you mean? When? When? When is the system supposed to work? Nah, give him benefit of the doubt. He's a Jew. It's a precious neshama. He gives a lot of tzedakah. He's a good guy. Oh, you want to give him kaf schut? You want to give him benefit of the doubt? But how come if one of the prophets, one of the neviim from the Torah walked into your shul, not only you throw him out, you get him arrested. Why? Because he told you the truth. Every single one of the prophets that's mentioned in the Torah rebuke the people in ways that make us look like little puppies. The stuff that Jeremiah told the people, the stuff that Isaiah told the people, the stuff that Amos told the people, the stuff that Yechezkel told the people. All of the prophets told Am Yisrael things that were strong and difficult to hear. And these were the best of the best. Now, anyone that's quoting them today, he's not even saying everything they said. It's just a little quote. I just used one of the verses that, that Yechezkel said. I just used one of the verses that Jeremiah says. One of the verses that Moshe Rabbeinu says. Oh, no, I'm not allowed in your shul anymore. I'm not allowed to give lectures in your shul anymore. You don't want anyone to give out my CDs anymore. So I don't get kafzchut. I have evil intentions. But the guy that's driving on Shabbat for 25 years and also donating for 25 years... Yes, yes, Kafzchut. Who's the Rasha here? Who's the Rasha here? So that's what you see. You see, Rabotai, that sometimes Erev Rav comes in the form of a rabbi. I one time, and then we'll finish this with this story. I saw this with my own eyes. And I have witnesses to this. I have witnesses to the story. One of them is here. There's not that many people here, so you can figure out who. A group of people wanted to do tshuva. Ishtabach Shimo. Wanted to do tshuva. Wanted to learn Torah. Started coming to shurim, arranging shurim. Baruch Hashem. Started keeping Shabbat. Some of them weren't able to go to shul anymore on Shabbat because it was too far from their house. So the rabbi had a problem with this. How come you're not coming? No, I can't drive on Shabbat, Rabbi. No, come on. No, who's telling you this? Oh, Rabbi Reuven, telling us this. Ah, I don't know. Maybe he's extreme. He's fanatic. No, you should meet him. He's a nice guy. You know what? Bring him to my house. We'll do a shiur at my house. Such a open Rabbi. Bring him to my house. We'll do a shiur at my house. They tell me, Rabbi, we're going to do a shiur at the Rabbi's house. 
maybe you could influence them to also teach like you. I said, I was still naive then. I thought I could. So I go to this guy's house, older man, very 70, 75 years old. We're at the house. We're having a shoe. I bring some CDs to the group. The rabbi says, hello, hello, very nice, da, da, da. He sits right next to me. In the beginning of the shiur, he started trying to debate a little bit, but every time he had an issue, I would bring him a source, and he couldn't really defend. And we had a shiur, and then after the shiur, he said, wow, fantastic shiur, really good. Yeah, you guys are going in the right direction. In front of me, you guys are going in the right direction. He's good, he's this, that, nice. Right? Good, right? So, said, Bezat Hashem, we'll do something together one day. We'll do a shiur at the Bikini or something, right? I don't get any calls, but, you know, I see the guys are coming to the shiur. But then, uh, one day, one of them comes to me and says, uh, you're never going to believe it, Rabbi. So what? You know those CDs that you brought to the rabbi as a gift, to give to people in the kila and so on? I said, yeah. He says, nobody got it in the kila. I said, why not? He says, because the rabbi is hiding it. I said, what? What do you mean he's hiding it? He says, I walked into his office and I walked in on him hiding the CDs. Hiding the CDs in the office. Doesn't want anyone to see him. Doesn't want anyone to get the CDs. Doesn't want anyone to do tshuva. In front of your face. Chazaku baruch. Good shiur. We're going to do something together. As soon as you leave, he's back to Erev Rav. Back to Erev Rav. Rabotai Karim, this is very much real. This happens a lot. It happens a lot because we're in a generation where En al mili smoch ela elavinu sheba shamayim. The Gemara Masechet Sota, page 49b, says the generation before Mashiach will be so such an orphaned generation that you will have nothing to rely on other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What does it mean to rely on HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Of course, having Emunah, having Bitachon, but what about knowledge? You have to rely on what's written in the Torah itself, what's written in the Gemara, what's written in the Poskim. What's the real Chachamim saying? You can't just take people's word for it anymore. A guy can look like a rabbi, but instead of being a rabbi, he's a rabbi. He's an evil by. He hopefully goes bye-bye. He looks like a rab, but he's an Erev rab. And a person needs to be careful of this. Why? Because David the Melech himself says, these people are so bad, I hate them, they're my enemy. David the Melech had a lot of enemies, but this is the one he's writing about. Most dangerous. Why? Because unlike the other enemies that are trying to kill our bodies, these Erev rab are trying to kill our souls. And sometimes they come to us in the form of people that look perfectly fine, look religious. To such an extent that someone like Hafez Chaim would curse them every day. So this Rabotai is just a little bit of an understanding of just to keep our eyes open. To make sure that anytime you hear something that disagrees or contradicts one of the things that we say in Ishiur, please bring it to me. Say, listen, this is... A mistake or no? You said A, he said B. Is there two opinions or is you made a mistake, he made a mistake? Who's, what's going on here? Something that's significant. Don't tell me about every little, uh, you know, he said A, you said B, you know, uh, A. Say uh, things that are significant. If you hear somebody saying to you that the things that we're talking about, you're saying the opposite, you got to find out. you got to double check in the books. Why? Because I know for sure it's right. I've seen it a million times. If you're hearing something wrong, you're hearing something that's different, it's wrong. There's no doubt in my mind. But before you start believing the opposite, before you start believing that it's allowed to be wasting seed, that it's allowed to drive on Shabbat, that it's allowed to eat non-kosher, that it's allowed to do all types of things, double check. Don't lose your soul. Don't lose your soul so quickly. Don't be one of these fools that just goes with whatever is the easiest opinion. It's very important for a person to know that many times the Yetzirah will come to you in a form of something that looks like a mitzvah. Looks kosher. 
She's not going to come to you with a uh, something that looks obviously bad. She's going to come to you with something that looks good, looks kosher. And you have to make sure that you pay attention to the details. Because if you don't pay attention to the details, that's it. You're already in a trap. You made it easy for him. So with that being said, Bechavod, who wants to start with the first question? A person that Mechalel Shabbat cooks for you? Yeah. A person that Mechalel Shabbat cooks for you, you're not allowed to eat it. Because if he violates Shabbat, you cannot, he does obviously does not care about his own soul, which means, needless to say, he doesn't care about your own soul. Which means what? Means that he's not reliable to keep all of the rules as far as Kashrut. So, you care about your soul, so if you're going to cook something, or your wife's going to cook something more likely, you're going to make sure that the meat that you buy is kosher, that it's not mixed with uh, cheese, it's not mixed with dairy, it's not mixed with non-kosher, and so on. Him, on the other hand, you can't have that same reliability on. Why? He has no Yilat Shemaim. He has no fear of Hashem. He doesn't even keep Shabbat, the basic minimum of being a Jew, which means that if he goes to the supermarket, and the supermarket, they sell kosher meat and also non-kosher meat. It's one of these big supermarkets. And they're right next to each other. They're right next to each other. And if he sees... The kosher steak is $18 a pound, and a non-kosher steak is $1.80. And they look exactly the same. In fact, the non-kosher looks, is much bigger. What does he do? He says, yalla, let's go. They won't know. Why? By the time it's on their plate, you can't tell kosher, non-kosher. Can't tell non-kosher, non-kosher. So that guy that's not keeping Shabbat, you can't rely on his food. You can't rely on his food. Where is there a leniency there? The leniency, Rav Vadia says, is if it's your mom. Your mom is Jewish and she is a not Shomer Shabbat, unfortunately. But she knows you are. She knows you are and she's not anti. She's not anti-Torah. If she cooks you food, you're allowed to eat it. As long as you know that all the ingredients she used were kosher and, she, uh, and so on. She doesn't cook non-kosher food ever. She just doesn't keep Shabbat. You can eat her food. Why? Because she loves you. Even more than herself. But that's, again, only if she cooks only kosher food in general. She just doesn't keep Shabbat. This is more common in Israel than it is in America. But the point is, is that anyone else, stranger, doesn't keep Shabbat. He's a Jew, doesn't keep Shabbat, can't, can't, can't eat his food. Can't eat his food. Now, there is a, uh, another leniency if it's a uh, situation where, if it's in restaurants and there's a mashkiach there, that oversees all of the ingredients. And in addition to that, he turns on the fire for everyone. He turns on the fire. And he sees that they're putting the ingredients that he verified are kosher. They're simply putting it in the pan. They're simply putting it out of the pan. All they're doing, so he treats them like goyim. Because if a goy, you can use a goy to cook for you if you put on the fire and you put on all the ingredients. You can use a goy. You can... That's not a problem. You have a mashkiach, you have somebody that's overseeing it, even you yourself are overseeing it, that's not a problem. But if he by itself, you just show up to his house, you show up to his house, or you show up to shul, and you see that the only guy in the kitchen is this Michal Shabbat. He's the one that cooked it, he's the one that bought it, he's the one that did everything, not allowed to eat it. And some won't even eat it from the, uh, the other leniency that I've mentioned. Many will not eat from the other leniency that I've mentioned. But the point is, is that the, uh, if, if, if somebody, you don't know who did what, you have no idea where the meat is and so on, no. not allowed. Why? And it's a very big deal because when, I, when you eat something that's not kosher, even if you don't know it's not kosher, let's say you, made, you, you have a plate, you have something, and the supermarket made a mistake. The guy that was putting labels on the things, he started putting kosher on everything, even though it wasn't kosher, you made a mistake. Now you ate it, thinking it's kosher. It's not your fault. Right? It's not your fault. You didn't do it on purpose. You ate it, you cooked it, everything, put all the good ingredients, but in reality, the meat's not kosher. Guess what? Your neshama is still going to get affected. Even though it's not on purpose, your neshama is still going to get affected. Why? 
הקדוש ברוך הוא says ונטמאתם בם. Not kosher food affects you and makes you tamay. All of a sudden it's hard for you to understand stuff. All of a sudden you forget. All of a sudden you feel like going to a nightclub. Three o'clock in the morning, you're married with four kids. All of a sudden you have all types of shtuot in your head. What happened? Check your food. Check your food. It could also be Yetzirah, but the point is that you have to be careful with food. That's why some people are very, very serious about kashrut. They don't eat kashrut from just anybody. They order from specific people that they know they can rely on. Like I can tell you myself, I'm not going to mention the name. There's one store in my neighborhood, I wouldn't buy bazooka gum from them. They sell meat. And some people told me it's really, really good quality meat as far as like deliciousness. Me personally, I wouldn't want, I, I personally wouldn't buy bazooka gum from them. Why? They don't keep anything. They don't keep anything. They don't keep Shabbat, they don't keep nothing. So, to go buy from a supermarket that the guy is not keeping anything, why? If I have an option of somebody that keeps Torah Mitzvot, especially the option sometimes is next door or down the street, he keeps Torah and Mitzvot, and this guy's Mechel Shabbat, why should I buy from him? Why? It's, 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 I'm starving. Do I have to eat? You know, so sometimes, uh, you know, we order. We order from New York. Why do we order from New York? Trust their kashrut more. Certain companies in the oh, I trust their kashrut more than I trust in a uh, place in Florida sometimes. There are some places in Florida that are good, no problem. But sometimes we'll order from New York. Why? Because there's certain places that I prefer their kashrut. Some people are much more strict. What do they do? They don't buy from anybody. What do they do? They don't buy from anybody. Even the guy that has big rabbis supporting him every day, don't buy from nobody. What do they do? They get a few people together, they get a shochet, they buy a cow, yalla, let's go, I want to see it. I want to see you slaughter the cow. No, I want to see. No, no. Yalla, chazak u baruch. If you slaughter the cow, they get it. That's how they do it. Not as common here in America, but it happens. You get a few families together, you get a shochet that's really good at what he does because you could risk potentially losing the whole thing. If the guy makes a mistake, you have to sell to the Arabs. For half the value. But anyway, some people are very, very strict with it. I think it's a little too much, but point is, is that everybody's in their own level. Everybody's in their own level. The key is to understand is that when it comes to kashrut, everyone that knows something knows it's a big deal. So don't just eat anything that's, you know, sounds kosher or has a sticker on it. You know, just be, be a little more conscious of there's levels, there's levels. There's levels of kashrut. Uh, and a person needs to be conscious of these things and al- always, always be a stringent on this. Because your neshama on the line, it can affect you, especially if you're learning, if you're learning Torah. So, now, on the other hand, some people say, don't eat meat at all. There's some tzaddikim that say, don't eat meat at all. Why? You can't rely on anybody. Can't rely on anybody. The, my Rav, I've asked him this before. For a little while, we stopped eating meat. But then my Rav told me, eat meat. He said, yeah, but this, but that. He said, eat meat. Eat it. Why? He says, number one, I see you, you're getting weak. And the, you're not able to learn as much, you're not able to do this, you're physically getting weak. And the, what you're trying to you know, not make up as a, as, as a possible mistake is creating a lot more harm than good of you not eating meat. So eat meat. Second thing is, he says, if you don't trust the kosher institutions as a whole, pretty much you don't trust anybody, then you simply can't eat anything. You can't eat, it's not just meat. You can't drink coffee. Maybe they have some bugs in it for, 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 for flavoring. You can't eat candy. There's bugs in there also for flavoring and for food coloring. Can't eat anything, nothing. Milk, milk, you can't get milk. Why? Maybe it's milk from a camel. What, did you see the cow being milked? You see the cow? No, you see the cow. All you see is a little plastic bottle, has some milk in it, but it has a picture of a cow. So, I have a lot of pictures. You get it from Vistaprint, uh, two cents. So, I mean, you can't just not trust anyone. You have to trust the kosher institution as a whole. 
Because or else you just simply can't live. And you can't say, no, no, I just don't trust him on the meat part. That's nonsense. You're just being, uh, you know, crazy. Okay, so, so it's important to be stringent when you can be, but don't go too far to the extent where you just pretty much you're like on strike against everyone in the world. doesn't work. doesn't work. You're not going to get very far. So my own rabbi taught you. I, we did this for a few months, and uh, it didn't work out so well, especially when I got rebuked. But the point is, is that, again, you have to trust the system to a certain extent. If you can get better quality meat, always get the best. Always get the best quality, even if it's more expensive. If you get halak, bet yourself... It's going to cost you 10, 15, 20% more, which usually doesn't, but let's say it does, pay for it. Why? Kadosh Bokhu pays. Kadosh Bokhu pays. You know, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a, uh, important for a person to spend his money on mitzvot. Don't try to save money on mitzvot. Oh no, this guy's a butcher. You know, his uh, chicken is only $8. This guy's chicken is like $11, $12. Why should I pay so much money? It's just a chicken. No, no, it's not just a chicken. It's not just a chicken. Sometimes it's because the kashrut over here is, uh, I don't know, some guy that's uh, maybe not even Jewish. And this guy actually has some Yeret Shamaim Jews. You guys think it's a uh, new? No. Rav Ovadi Alava Shalom. When he went to Egypt, he went to Egypt, became a Rav in Egypt. First job, found out that the Shochet over there, the butcher over there, the famous Shochet over there, was selling people Nevelot Vitrefot. He came over there, he saw what he saw, he says, took out, in front of everybody, took out his kashrut. Pretty much, out of business. The guy took a gun out, wanted to kill him. He said, you can kill me, you're still not going to get the kashrut back. Years later, after Rav Adi already went back to Eretz Yisrael, one day somebody shows up to it in his house, walks into the house, because people were able to walk to his house and just somehow get in, walks in, has a gun. Points at Rabbi Vadi again. Who is it? The same guy from Egypt. He said, give my kashrut back. He goes, go, go. You're still not getting it. 20 years past, you're still not getting the kashrut back. Why? Once you have verified that you're selling people in their velot with refot, that's it, you can't get kashrut. Some people, they may sell kosher food, but it's horrible stuff. Like I had one place I bought food from. Now, once in a while this happens. You deal with meat and stuff like that, it happens. But when it becomes a pattern where... Four, five, six times out of eight or out of seven times, you see that the top part of the meat looks great. The bottom part has mold. That means that that guy, he's not a kosher person. Forget the chicken. The chicken may be kosher. It's not good, though. You can't eat it. It has mold. But he's not kosher. He's selling you old meat. It's the nice meat on top. And the bottom meat that already went bad, he still wants to sell it and get full price. He's not kosher. If he's not kosher, you can't buy nothing from him. You can't buy bazooka gum from him. And it happened several times. A few times. They sell you a piece of meat. You know, it happens one time. Okay, no big deal. It happens five, six times already. No, that's something wrong. Say something wrong. Every time there's mold. Where are you, in a, in a cave? Were you keeping this thing in a sand instead of a fridge? Look, why, why is that mold? So many times. Yeah, it's because it's part of the system. This, by the way... Happens a lot more. Don't think it's just the Jewish people. This happens on a regular basis in the non-Jewish world. In practically every supermarket, there are complaints of different things that they find in their meat over there because people that are in the meat industry themselves disclose this, and I saw this with my own eyes, where they say that in a non-kosher world, even if they see that there's cancer in the meat, they sell it. Cancer. There's cancer cells in the meat. There's tumors. In the meat, they sell it anyway. They cut out the tumor, obviously. Not going to keep you a tumor. Cut out the tumor, but they sell the rest of the meat. They don't want to lose $5, 10 $20, sometimes more. They sell it. In fact, after the meat goes bad, what do they do? They put certain enzymes on top of the meat that changes its color, looks brand new. The meat goes back to looking brand new. Looks fresh. Looks like they literally just slaughtered the cow or whatever animal five minutes ago. They put some enzymes on it. Changes the entire color. I saw it with my own eyes. Unbelievable. Or sometimes they'll inject the, uh, the, uh, the meat with, uh, with uh, water. Why? 
build it up, looks puffier. The real chicken looks like it was on strike of a uh, food strike for three weeks. But then when you get in the store, it looks puffy like it was uh, living with uh, living large. Eating McDonald's every day. It's puffy chicken. In reality, you cut it, it's almost like all the air comes out. What happens? Oh, oh, it's so juicy. It's not juicy, it's just water, buddy. This is water. That's what's in it. It happens. It happens on a regular basis. The meat industry is filthy. Filthy. You know, the goyim, obviously, it's a regular basis. They do this in restaurants. They do it everywhere. So... It's a, uh, to just say no one, not possible. You have to trust the system itself, but you have to be careful. You have to, if you can, get to know who the uh, owner of the uh, store is, who's the mashgiach. Try to find out some things. Try to get as familiar as possible with those people as you can, the best you can. Why? I get some, maybe, maybe you don't have to get to know them, but you know somebody that does. Oh, yeah, that guy, yeah, he's a good guy. He's got Shemaim, he's a good guy. Learn with him, Daf Yomi, this, that. Okay, if he does that, it's no problem. Have have something in it. Have something invest in it. Why? Because, again, like I said, it's a... Uh, unfortunately, Erev Rav shows up in many, many different forms and sizes. And money is a fantastic tool to buy Erev Rav. Fantastic tool. Next question. Now that I scared you guys, you're not going to eat for a week. Kid. I think he has a question that he's reading right now. If it's that complicated, I don't know if I'm reading. Uh-huh. Eleven out of thirteen on Shabbat. Shabbat. Yeah, yeah. How about this? We'll make it easier. We'll make it easier. Nine hundred as a thousand people praying. Thousand people praying. Nine hundred and ninety-one don't keep Shabbat. Nine hundred and ninety-one don't keep Shabbat. Nine of them keep Shabbat. Nine keep Shabbat. You have a minyan? You have a thousand people. You have a minyan? No minyan. I mean, needless to say, 11 out of 13 don't keep Shabbat. It's not minyan. What does that mean? You have no minyan. You have 15 people, 20 people praying. Nobody keeps Shabbat or most people keep Shabbat. What does that mean? You can't say Kaddish. Source is Ilchot uh, Rambam, Ilchot Shabbat, chapter 30, Alakha number 15. Mechalel Shabbat u kegoy lechol davar. Someone that violates Shabbat is considered 100% a goy, an idol worshiper, the Rambam says, which means that 13 people are there, 11 of them, 11 of them are considered idol worshippers. Now, if I brought you Mustafa, and then I brought you Chris over here, and I said, these guys are going to give you a shiul, say Kaddish at the end of the shiul. Anyone say, I meant this Kaddish? No, why? They're idol worshippers, these people. You don't say amen to a blessing by an idol worshiper. The Gemara says it in many places of the deen of a Mechalel Shabbat. The Zohar says, the Shuchan Aruch says, everyone says. It's not a Chumrah. It's not a stringency. When a person violates Shabbat, he is considered not only an idol worshiper. He's considered a person that screams out to Hashem, I don't believe in you. That's what the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says. So, it's a, important for a person to know that if you have a place where most people are not keeping Shabbat, you don't have at least 10 people that are keeping Shabbat, you do not have a minyan, which means that if they say Kaddish, you're not allowed to say Amin. You're not allowed to have them do the blessings on a Torah. If they do the blessings on a Torah, on Shabbat or during the week, as one of the aliyot, the first, the first uh, three during the week, or all seven on Shabbat, if they're one of the first seven, they do the blessings, you're not allowed to say amen. Why are you not allowed to say amen? Because like saying amen to a blessing of an idol worshiper. If an idol worshiper came to you and was like, oh, 
I pray to uh, Yoshke. Say Amen. You're not going to say Amen. Why? You're a Jew. When a Mechalel Shabbat does a blessing, it's like it's like idol worship is doing a blessing. That's a problem. It's a very serious problem. Now he doesn't mean he doesn't want to. He doesn't believe in uh, that he's an idol worshiper. He doesn't believe in idol worship. Well, Torah does. Torah does. Now some say, okay, maybe he's not a hundred percent like an idol worshiper. Where maybe you could uh, maybe he's a He's a captured baby. Just grew up a certain way. Grew up in a certain town. Maybe we could be a little lenient. Tinok shenishba, and that's a confused confusion that people have. People think that if someone's tinok shenishba, which virtually doesn't really exist very much in this generation, but let's say it does. Let's you know, I met a couple, one for sure, a woman that was seventy nine years old, just discovered she's a Jew. That's an obvious tinok shenishba. She thought she was Christian her whole life. That's an obvious tinok shenishba. So they do exist, but it's not people that are living in. Uh, you know, cities that have uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of Jews. But let's say, let's say, let's say we go with a linear opinion of Tinoch Shinishba. People think that just because he's now a Tinoch Shinishba, that's it, he's like everybody else. Wrong. Even if somebody's a Tinoch Shinishba, it doesn't mean like he's like everybody. It doesn't mean he goes to heaven. Like if he dies tomorrow, he doesn't go to heaven. If a Tinoch Shinishba still doesn't keep Shabbat, dies the next day, he doesn't go to heaven. He still goes to Gehenom. A tinok shinishba is simply an halachic term to use pertaining to how you treat him while he's alive. Which means, he's a tinok shinishba, right? He doesn't keep Shabbat, but he touched your wine. If he was not a tinok shinishba and he knew he's violating Shabbat anyway and he touched your wine, you have to throw the wine out. But since he's a tinok shinishba, the leniency is, you don't have to throw the wine out. That's it. That's it. Some say, oh, maybe you can count them in Minyan. Maybe not. And some uh, doesn't go to heaven. But either way, no one says that they can go do the blessings on the Torah. Why? Because when the people have an aliyah, people have an aliyah to the Torah, what are they doing really? They're doing a mitzvah in the name of everyone. When people say Kaddish, what are they doing? They're doing a mitzvah in the name of everyone. So rather than everyone do this blessing on a Torah, rather than everyone say Kaddish individually, he is saying it in their name. He's in essence taking it on himself, and by you saying Amen, it's like you did it. So a guy that's a Michalel Shabbat, whether he's a Tinok Shanishba or not a Tinok Shanishba, he's a Michalel Shabbat. He cannot, in any circumstance, take mitzvot on himself. He's not even doing what he's supposed to. He's, no, he's in no position to take on your mitzvot. Hence the reason why if he does a Birkat Torah as one of the seven, one of the seven aliyot, and you say Amen, it's a Brachal Levatalah. It's saying Hashem's name in vain. It's a sin from the Torah, one of the Ten Commandments. So how come you still see Mechal Shabbat sometimes get an aliyah in a good shul? Not a bad one. Not the ones that... Uh, sometimes you'll see they get an aliyah anyway. What aliyah do they give them? They give them the Mosif. Mosif is number 8, 9, 10, 11, which are, they're really doing, when they do the blessing, they're just doing the blessing for themselves. They're not doing the blessing for anybody else. But that's because we've already filled up the first seven spots of people that were Shomre Shabbat that took on the mitzvah for everybody else. He's a Mosif. He's number eight, nine. We don't have to have a Mosif. The Mosif is just an extra, just if you feel like adding it. Just to give him like some, you know, encouragement to keep coming back. Give him some kavots. You give him an aliyah anyway, number eight, number nine, number 17, whatever you want. But more than seven, beyond seven, you can count to a thousand if you want. Give everybody an aliyah. But the first seven, the ones that are given the, doing the bracha for the klal, absolutely, absolutely no permission to have it as a mechalad shabbat. He's in no position to take on anybody else's responsibility because he's not even fulfilling his own responsibility. So if a person says amen to his blessing, it's a bracha levatala. So if a person goes to a shul that does not have at least 10 people that are shomre shabbat, find a real shul. You don't have a real shul, pray at home. 
Pray at home. Why? Because you praying at home is better than you praying with 13 Mechalei Shabbat. Why is it better? Because if you're praying with 13 Mechalei Shabbat, surely they're going to say Kaddish. Surely they're going to bring out the Torah. Which means what? You're going to be a partner to a sin. They're going to say, no, come on, come on. No, no, we'll give you an Aliyah today. It's not that many of us. You get your turn. You're going to get an Aliyah. So now you have to do an Aliyah. You get an Aliyah. A non-kosher Aliyah. You're going to be responsible for sins. You go to Bikness, do mitzvot or sins? If you want to go make sins, go to a nightclub instead. You have more fun. Go jump off a roof. I don't know. You have fun on the way down. You don't go to Bikness to make sins. Go to Bikness to make mitzvot. If there's no kosher minyan, it's not a bed knesset. It's a building with people in it. Instead of going to the Bikneset with 13 people, that are Mechale Shabbat, say, guys, listen, today, my rabbi gave me different instructions. Instead of us praying Shachrit together, I brought a projector. It's already set up. I came here at 5 o'clock in the morning. You guys are here. Just have a seat. You can have your talit on if you want. If you want to feel good about your talit, no problem. Put the talit on, put the feeling on. But instead of praying, instead of reading from the we're going to do something else. What are we are going to do? Yeah, hey, we're going to watch it. Play. One of the shiulim. Have all 13 of them. Watch one of the shiulim together. But it's not the same. By the end of the shiul, they're all going to keep Shabbat. I have to watch the shield together, not, not uh, have a fake minyan. Why? They watch shield, they'll understand what violating Shabbat is, they'll start keeping Shabbat. But to pray a uh, fake minyan, there's no toilet whatsoever. There's no, 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 nothing good comes out of it. Oh, they'll get offended. Let them get offended. How come you're not uh, worried about Hashem getting offended? person needs to know that there are rules to the Torah. It's not suggestions. Next question. Yes. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, of course. Even if a person grows up at Tinok Shanishba, he grew up in some kibbutz, he grew up in some Christian's house or whatever it is. But the minute he shows up to shul and he understand, he, he's told that you have to keep Shabbat, at that moment he is no longer a Tinok Shanishba. Now, of course, he's not going to be able to adopt all of the rules in one second. Number one, because he doesn't know all of them. And number two, because it's a major life adjustment. But you cannot consider him, you know, a Tinok Shinishba in perpetuity. You know, regardless of how he grew up, regardless of what he went through. And that's one of the things that the Reshaim, the Erev Rav, want people to think. Where they think that the, everybody is a Tinok Shinishba because they all grew up secular and therefore Hashem is going to forgive them. This is Erev Rav 101. This is the same tool that all of Erev Rav use. Pretty much they want to absolve everyone from sin. Uh, but the truth is, is that no one can absolve you from sin. We're not Christianity. And in reality, the fact that there are so many people uh, that are actually secular helps the generation to some aspect in a strange way. This is a chidush that I had about two years ago. And it's very interesting. It's, again, we want all of Am Yisrael to do tshuva. Both the religious people need to do tshuva and the non-religious need to do tshuva. Now, everyone knows that the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed for multiple reasons. One of the reasons was Chilul Shabbat. Another reason was Sinat Chinam. Now, and there's other reasons also. There's probably around 50 different reasons that are mentioned by Chazal of why the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed. Now, Lashon Ara is the most popular reason that people know about. But yet people continue saying Lashon Ara. Now, interestingly enough, if you say Lashon Ara about a Mechalel Shabbat or a secular person, person doesn't keep Shabbat, doesn't keep mitzvot, it's not, there's no Lashon Ara. There's no deen of Lashon Ara. You're allowed to say Lashon Ara about someone that does not keep Shabbat. Now, although it's, we're not happy that this guy is not keeping Shabbat, 
there is a plus here. What's the plus? The plus is that all of the people that do keep Shabbat, but say Lashonara about this guy, at least they're not going to go to Gainom for it. Why? Because the Rambam says, if somebody says Lashonara once in a while, he's going to get punished for it. But if somebody says Lashonara on a regular basis, there's no share of the world to come. So some of these women that like to talk a lot, you know, every day they have three-hour phone calls with their friends. Out of the three hours, two hours and 59 minutes, Allah one minute is just saying hello. And if they're always talking about the neighbor that doesn't keep and this and that. If this issue was not there, if the Chafetz Chaim didn't write this in words, these women that are keeping Shabbat, keeping mitzvot, keeping everything, they would go to Gainon permanently. So the fact that they're talking about a secular person is actually Now, of course, we don't want this to continue. We don't want this person to continue saying Lashonara, and we don't want this person to continue violating Shabbat. We want both of them to fix themselves. But there is some nechama in this issue. There seems that there's some mercy in Hashem that you have this circumstance. You have this issue. But you can never, ever say that it's good to say Lashonara, and you can never, ever say that it's good to violate Shabbat. It's just that you see the good and the bad. Point being is, our job in the world is to help Am Yisrael go get closer to Hashem by showing them the one and only truth. Even if it's inconvenient, even if it's not comfortable, even if it's against what their rabbi said, or Erev Rav said, whoever said. Now when a person stands up for the truth, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him siyat bishmaya. As a person stands up for the Sheker, eventually Hashem punishes that person by exposing him to the world, showing that he's a Shekhan, that he's a liar. Now, there was a guy years ago in uh, Hungary that uh, in Kila in Satmel, when the Rebbe Mi Satmel was still very young, was a av- young Avrich, and uh, the whole Kila was keeping to one mitzvot. But this one guy was very rich, owned a meat factory. And he decided to maybe uh, modernize things up a little bit. You know, he made some money, wants to celebrate. Let's do some, have a good time. So he set up a big party, invited the boys, invited the girls, let them have a good dance together. Isur Karet, Arek V'al Yavor, didn't consider that. When the young Avrech, the young Avrech, who later becomes the Rebbe Misatmer, found out about this, he ran to the place, and he called one of the people, told him, get this guy outside, I want to talk to him. So the owner, the Balabite, who's this young religious, what does he want from me? No, no, come on, come on, just, he's a porn of Rech, he's a Tomi Chacham. Talk to him. Okay, comes outside. To his surprise, this rich guy thinks, maybe he wants some tzedaka, maybe this. What does he want from me, this guy? Maybe he wants to come in, he wants, what does he want? The Rebbe Misatma says to him, what are you doing? Rasha, you're a sinner and you're making other people sin. You're an enemy of Hashem. The guy got upset, pushed him. Who are you to tell me? The Rebbe Misatma says that hand that just made that sin and called all of those people to make sins is going to get chopped up to pieces. The guy got even more upset, tried to beat up the Rebbe Misatma. The little young Avrech says to him, now that you made a sin with your whole body, your entire body is going to get chopped up. The guy laughed this off went his direction, went, made a bunch of sins, caused many other people to make sins that night, had some drinks, had some fun, and went home. The next morning, he goes back to his company, his meat factory, making millions, doesn't have to do very much, shows up, gets to the factory, as the Kadosh Baruch Hu would have it, when a tzaddik says something, a Kadosh Baruch Hu fulfills it. As the Gemara says, this guy slips in some, uh, in some way down the stairs, rolls down the stairs, and goes right into the meat grinder. 
Hashem Yishmol V'yatzil. And just like the Rebbe Misatmel told him the night before, he became pieces. Became peace, became little hot dogs. Why? Choteu Machti. Cause people to sin. You're a sinner yourself. You're an enemy of Hashem. And even when you got rebuked by a tzaddik, you went against it anyway. Not only you're making sins, not only you're making other people sin, but you got rebuked. Akadosh Baruch Hu sent you a private messenger to wake you up. You rejected it. Akadosh Baruch Hu says, that's it, you're finished. Finished. Next day, next day, Amash, the whole Keila was scared for years. To this day, people are scared of hearing the name the Rabbi Misatmel. It was Ish, Ish Kadosh. So Ish Kadosh. The Baba Sali says the Rebbe Misatma is one of the 36. One of the 36 tzaddikim that the whole world stood on when he was alive. So you need to have 36 tzaddikim in the world that are usually hidden in order for the world to exist. The Baba Sali, one of the Gdolei Olam, who probably himself was one of the 36. Who knows? He himself says the Rebbe Misatma is one of the 36, for sure. No question. He says he's the Gdolei Olam. He's something else. So, when a person understands that Akadosh Baruch Hu said certain things, some people don't understand it, some people don't know it, so he sends prophets. Now, we don't have prophecy like we had 2,000 years ago. But Akadosh Baruch Hu sends people to speak to Emet. Prophet, Navi, comes from Niv Sfatayim, a speaker. A speaker is Niv Sfatayim, someone that speaks, speaks to Emet. Hashem is going to send speakers to be the messengers of truth to the people. Now, if a person has sins, it's not good. A person causes other people to sin, it's terrible. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu will still send them a prophet, will still send them a speaker to tell them the truth. If he still rejects it at that point, after he sins, he causes other people to sin, and Hashem sends them the messenger, and he rejects it anyway, enemy of Hashem. Enemy of Hashem. Some people are enemies of Hashem, don't even know. They don't know nothing. They're, they're eating pig and feeding people pig. They don't know there's anything wrong with it. We're talking about people that know, people that don't care. Enemy of Hashem. Such people, David the Melch says, I hate them more than anyone. I pray for them to die every day. Next question. Yeah? Is it a sue for a Jewish teenager to follow sports? Now, the Yetzirah is very, very smart, very clever, and makes people think that uh, eating non-kosher cow is better than eating pig. This is not allowed, that's not allowed. Now, sports, where does the word sports come from? Sparta. Sparta were the place where you have people where all they cared about is their body, their physique, the materialism, and the anti Torah. What does it mean to be anti-Torah? Anti-Torah means they cannot live in peace so long as the Torah exists. So these people, these Reshaim, did everything they possibly could to destroy the Jews by enticing them to join sports, to live life, to be careful about their physique, do all types of exercises. They made the Colosseums where they would have, they still have these Colosseums, uh, in, in uh, the old ones in Rome and other places around the world in Greece. But then you have giant ones all over the United States. You just call them sports stadiums. These are coliseums. Where you have 22 giant overgrown males trying to kill each other over some pig skin. Or a bunch of guys trying to fight over a little uh, ball. Uh, whatever it is, all of these people. This is all Sparta. This is continuation of Sparta. Now... The mentality of following sports being allowed is one of the tools of Amalek, one of the tools of the Arab that you're allowed to follow sports. Why? 
Because sports, unlike anything else, sports is very addictive. You can't just watch a game that you don't know who's playing. Like, you're not just going to watch some random high school basketball game and everybody else is just an average player or less. You have to watch the NBA. And it's not just the NBA. You have to watch the team that you like. And how you're going to like them, you have to follow them. You have to follow their players and who they're trading and who they're getting as the rookie of the year and who's the best assister and who's the best dister and that there and all that there and what kind of sneakers is he wearing and what kind of this and what's his salary cap and he's getting paid too much and he's getting paid too little and he signed with Nike but he's with Adidas and what ends up happening? You become a fan. What's a fan? What does fan come from? Fanatic. Fan comes from fanatic. What, that's what a fan is. Fanatic about sports. You know everything about these teams. So it's not you're not just watching a 90-minute game. You're investing your life into it. Because in order to like the game, to like the teams, you have to know who's playing and why you like them. You don't just like them because he's six foot six and uh, jumps uh, you know, jumps uh, 40 inches into the air and he runs a 40 and a 3-9. No, you don't care about that. You care about different things. So that means you have to invest a lot of time into this. And that is a lot more than the 90 minutes of the actual, or the 60 minutes that the basketball game or the football game or the baseball game is. It's a huge investment. You're constantly watching it. You're constantly looking at it. You're constantly arguing about it. Which means that even when you try to learn, you try to learn, you're thinking Rabbi Akiva, yeah, Rabbi Akiva, Karim Abu Jabbar, also... Uh, Be Akiva, Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, Michael this, Michael that, LeBron J. You're not even sure who you're reading about. You start to think maybe make maybe Rabbi Akiva and Rava, maybe his Talmidi, maybe Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the cave. He had a basketball hoop. You start distorting things in your head. You can't be focused when you're a fan. Now, are you allowed to play sports? Is a different question. Playing sports in order to exercise is allowed. You're allowed to play a little bit of basketball as long as it's not on Shabbat because for anyone that's an adult, the ball is considered mukze. And it's also something that you do during the Yemechol, during the weekday. It's not an action that you would do on Shabbat. But if it's during the week, you want to exercise via playing basketball, via exercising running or something like that, whatever you want to do, that's allowed. That's allowed to exercise. But to become a fanatic, to become one of these people that watches the games on a regular basis, absolutely forbidden, not only as a bitul Torah, but also as could be even considered Abu Dazra to some extent. Why Abu Dazra? When you become a fan, and I know quite a few of them, you simply start obsessing over these people, obsessing over the sport, fighting over it, crying over it. Your team lost. I can't believe it. Like, why is she doing this to me? Why is he doing this? What? You're 25 years old, you idiot. You're crying over a bunch of people that make $50 million a year because they lost? You idiot. Do you understand what they're going to do to you in Shemaim for crying over this, but not crying over the Bet HaMikdash? You didn't cry this much when your own father died, but you're crying over a basketball game, a football game, and not only that, you're blaming Hashem. Why is Hashem doing this to me? Like he has to change the world so you can continue going against him. The demented mentality that we have sometimes really boggles my mind. It's Mama's Chesed Elohim that was still alive. You see grown men crying over their football team, their basketball team, or God forbid if they're from Europe, or they're, they're not area of the world, soccer, Hashem Yishmo Vietzil. There's been murders over that game. Literally, they kill people. You think this is what Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Kedoshim tiyu ki Kadoshani, you're a holy nation? You think he was referring to those people? No. He was talking to us that are learning Torah, that are fanatic about Torah. You want to use exercise, use it for exercise, no problem. But to spend any time watching these sports, absolutely forbidden. In fact, the Stipler Gaon, Stipe Lagaon, Rav Kanievsky's father. Stipe Lagaon says, television, you watch television, news, 
Olympics, games, all that stuff. In those days, it was much better TV than today. Even in this day, it says watching regular news networks, right? regular TV, Avodah Zara Mamash. You called watching television, you're watching shows, you watch Netflix, you watch movies, regular base, this is your life, you watch sports, Avodah Zara Mamash. Idol worshiper. Yeah, but he goes to show, Rabbi. Okay, so there's a lot of people that idol worship go to show. So, a person needs to understand, in order to become the Jew that he's supposed to become, in order for her to become the Jew that they're supposed to become, the most important thing is to not allow the Tum'ah to enter your mind. Because if you allow the Tum'ah to enter your mind and enter your heart, it doesn't matter how many tzvot you do, there's always going to be filth on them. You can get the best piece of meat in the world, but if there's filth on it, no one's going to eat it. Doesn't matter what the cow was. It could be a red cow from the Bet HaMikdash. There's filth on it, no one's going to eat it. Your neshama cannot get to its full potential if it has filth on it. And if you allow this filth to constantly hit your system every day for an hour, two hours, three hours every day, how are you expecting to arrive to Olamba? How? How? How exactly do you expect to learn Torah and understand anything? When you go up to Shemaim, what are you going to tell Hashem? The, uh, the, uh, the annual salary cap of the Knicks for the last 20 years in a row, because you remember it by heart? Or who was the best trade over the last 20 years in baseball? What are you going to tell them in Shemaim? In Shemaim, you go up there, you have to say 40 days and 40 nights of Shur Torah. And some Chachamim say it's not 40 days. Wrong. It's 180 days. 180 days of Torah. No jokes. No jokes, no breaks, no bathroom, no food. 180 days straight of Torah. How, how are you going to have time to learn that much, to say that much, if you're, watching your, you're spending your time watching sports? How? How? Never. Never going to be. And you'll also notice that most successful people in the world do not waste their time on this stuff. There are a few exceptions here and there, but generally speaking, that's only after they became really, really successful and they have nothing to do with their life, like this uh, Mark Cuban that decided that he likes basketball and he bought a basketball team, so he goes to every game because he has nothing else to do with his life. But generally speaking, it's very rare. Successful people in life do not become fans of sports. They'll watch it randomly. They'll go once a year to a, some uh, Super Bowl game or whatever it is just for the show and to have something to do. But everyday fan, no chance in the world. Why? They're too busy being successful. If the people that are successful know that you cannot waste your life watching sports and watching TV and they just want to be successful in this world. It's even more so if you want to be successful in the next world as a Jew. How much your responsibility is to refrain from watching all of this nonsense and wasting your life. Next question. No. So, the Midrashim, and also it talks about in the Gemara and Zohar and so on, say that Shlomo HaMelech, in all of his wisdom, um, he understood that there's a lot more to this world than meets the eye. And he wanted to show people that there's more to this world. So he had a... Uh, the uh, king of the demons, Ashmedai, uh, captured. And then he told the king of the demons to go, yes, to serve him, because he was the, uh, Shlomo Melech was not a king of just flesh and blood. Shlomo Melech was king of everything. King of the birds, king of the animals, king of the, the, the demons, he was king of everything. Everyone served him. It's not like uh, today, uh, Trump or Putin or something like that. So, uh, Shlomo Melech told the uh, king of the demons to go get him 
some of these beings that live under the ground, that live in a different world, within our world. And he did. And one of them says that he brought him somebody that had multiple heads. Multiple heads. And uh, then he also brought him somebody really small. And so on and so forth. And different animals and all types of things that don't exist in this world, but nonetheless they do exist. So from here we learn that yes, there are things in the world that are very different than what we think is normal. And uh, I would speculate that it's very possible that if there is any pictures of uh, strange looking beings uh, that are floating on the internet, that people say, oh, this is an alien, this is a UFO that was captured. If any of that is real at all, it's not UFOs at all. It's people that, it's, it's things that live here. They just look different than us. So they, to us, it looks like it came from a different planet, but it's from this planet nonetheless. Uh, the Torah doesn't even say that there, uh, there is or there isn't life on other, other worlds because it's not going to affect us ever. There's never going to be like an Independence Day movie where there's a giant ship showing up to Earth and a bunch of aliens uh, you know, start to take over. That, that will never be. That will never be. But as far as strange beings uh, being discovered or seen, that's already happened. That's already happened. We have it in the Torah uh, that's mentioned. We used to have giants, uh, the, the Nephilim, the Anakim, uh, people with multiple heads, animals that don't exist anymore, uh, that if we saw them today, we would think that they have like uh, almost superpowers. Point being is that it's a, uh, there are many, many creatures that we would not consider normal, but nonetheless, they are part of this world and have always been. Uh, they're not like genetic mutations. They're just part of this world and they serve some other purpose. I have no idea what their purpose is, but nonetheless, they do have a purpose. There are certain animals that uh, used to exist that uh, were uh, very strange. Uh, there was one animal that's actually mentioned in the Torah that uh, was a animal that it's a, uh, was a vicious animal that uh, would destroy any animal, anything in its sight. Anything. Like No one can take this thing down unless you shot an arrow at a specific point which would be almost impossible, but nonetheless happened, where, uh, because it had, aside from its overwhelming power, but it had one limitation. What was this limitation? Its umbilical cord was tied to the ground, was connected to the ground. So it would travel everywhere, and its umbilical cord would go with it. The ground, in essence, almost, I guess, would go with it, I guess. But nonetheless, that's the, that was the limitation. You had to cut it off from there. Now, no one would even get close to it because they'll be eaten alive by then. But the point is, is that's why it had to be an arrow. So, strange animal like this, that's in the Torah also. Now, if it showed up right now in Broadway, New York right now, a bunch of people would think, ah, oh, an alien has arrived. Not an alien. It's always been here. Just, you never see it before. You know, it's a uh, same thing with mermaids. People think it's just a fairy tale. No, Barat says, and the Chachamim say, Rashi mentions it, and several other Chachamim say that there are uh, beings within the ocean that look half like man, half like fish. They do exist. They do exist. Now, there are some uh, places that say they saw it, and they, they, I mean, we don't know if anyone in today's world has a picture of it, but nonetheless, if our Torah says it exists, that's it. That's what we go by. It exists. It exists. You know, uh, and, and so some of these things are uh, quite a bit, you know, this is the part of the mystical parts. Now, somebody sent me a, uh, to add to your question, someone sent me a, um, a voicemail that they were shocked at the video that we published today by Arav Nisim Yagen, Allah uh, Shalom. Anyone that hasn't watched this uh, video should watch it. We put uh, some uh, English translation on it, subtitles. Now, to be scared, you don't have to watch the video. Just hear his voice. His voice alone is scary. But to actually see what he says... Scary stuff. What's it stuff? Says that uh, you know there was a uh, there's a common thing that happens. It's been going on already in Israel for years. Israeli soldiers and Israeli guys and girls, for whatever reason, they love 
the kohot atuma. They love the impure power, so they play with it through Ouija boards and doing seances. And these things are real. If you know how to do it, you could make certain things happen. You could bring neshamot from kafakela or genom even uh, to give you information. Now, it's forbidden 100% to do it, but nonetheless, there was a few people that did it. And it's very common in the Israeli army. And uh, one time a group of them did it, and they brought down the Shema of Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of uh, Medinat Israel. And Ben-Gurion was very upset that they bothered him, and he told him, where are you? He says, I am in boiling feces, being judged for all the sins that I've made. But now, because you burdened me, none of you are allowed to leave this room until the dawn, until the morning. So they're all scared, but one of them said at some point, okay, can I go to the bathroom? He said, you're only allowed to go to the bathroom if you go alone. So the guy gets up, goes alone. As soon as he goes alone, goes in the bathroom, they hear a huge sound, collapse. They run in there. They see this guy collapse unconscious, they breathe back into him, bring him back to life. What happened? He said, I saw him. He goes, what do you mean you saw, you saw what? So I saw Ben Gurion. So then they went back to the Ouija board and they said, what I, why, why is he so scared of you? Why is he so scary? He says, because after all of the suffering, the things that they're doing to him in, in Shamaim, he says, I've lost my, uh, the, my appearance of a human being. Like I don't look like a human being anymore. And even when he saw him, he says he's full of filth, he's full of feces, fecal matter. So, one of the people thought that in the beginning this was a joke, so Ben Gurion cursed him, told him that he's going to suffer and so on. The guy started getting shaking and getting scared. Point being is that this is one of many, many stories that are like this. There are many stories like this that Rabbi again and other Rabbanim have told over the years. And, and you have the witnesses. You have the people that tell the stories. It's actually a very famous movie that uh, Irgun Bechagve Sela publicized in the last several months of a famous story of a, um, a soldier that uh, was in the army. And um, he did a seance with, uh, I believe it was 11 or 12 other people. And they brought down a soul, and the soul told them that all of them are going to die. All of them are going to die in a war. Now it was during peace, there was no war. He said, what are you talking about? War, there's no war. He says, all of you are going to die soon. When? He gave them dates. All of it was within like a week. Now, all of them got scared to death. But figured, okay, at least there's no war. We're all actually going back home for a, for a weekend. So they all went back home for a weekend to have a good time. On that weekend, one of the wars of Eretz Yisrael started. Alarms all over the country, all of the reserves, all the guys on vacation have to go back to base. We're going on a mission. We're going back. There's a war. The country is at war. Shem Yishmor V'yatil. The guy says, all of them, they were one platoon. They were one group of people. And they went to war and he saw each one of them get killed one after another and they all noticed that the group is the only one that's dying in this in this situation one after another he says he's the only one that survived because he did tshuva started praying to Hashem crying to complete tshuva and this is probably uh, it's a famous story actually it's on the newspapers and so on he told this this video was made maybe 20 15 20 years after this whole thing happened so the point is, is that the mystical aspects of Judaism, the mystical parts of Judaism, literally have no end. There is uh, parts of the uh, of the world that are very abnormal to us, very abnormal to people that uh, are used to just seeing regular things. But nonetheless, they're standard language in the Jewish world. Rabbi Yudaftaya, Allah Shalom, one of the gedolim in the previous generation, would uh, oh this uh, mic. Is uh, dying.
Rabbi Yudaftai Alav HaShalom uh, used to deal with even more extreme things than this. Anyone that reads the book Minchat Yehuda, uh, different stories that Rabbi Yudaftai himself, uh, you know, of his own life, he would deal with Dibukim, which are even scarier than this. This is wicked neshamot that go into a uh, body of a living person and take over. Uh, and uh, he dealt with some really, really, you know, he would uh, try to help these neshamot in order to convince them to leave the people because they would cause them a lot of anguish. And he said that at one point he actually dealt with Shabtai Tzvi, Shem Reshaim Yerkav. Shabtai Tzvi is one of the fake Mashiachs that we had throughout the generations. He dealt with him. He helped uh, do a tikkun on his neshama. The stuff that he told him that he's dealing with, uh, you know, in the next world and how they're torturing him and what they're doing to him. Hashem Yishmo V'yatid. You guys think my shiur about Genom is scary? Just read that book. It's scary. But the point is, is that why, why, do anybody, why does anybody say all of these stories? What is the benefit of talking about seances of people that are suffering or people dying or Genom? Or what's the point of all of it? is a couple of things. Number one is for everyone to understand that life does not end with death. In fact, it's only the beginning. The beginning of the permanent life. So when a person knows that this life is just a corridor to the real life, if they know this, they'll act differently in this life. Second thing is to know that there is reward and punishment. Reward and punishment is a critical part of us, of our Torah. Without reward and punishment, we have no Torah. So it's very important for us to know that. The third thing is, is to understand that just because you don't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Now, you won't care if it exists or it doesn't exist if it doesn't affect you. Like, you don't care if radio waves exist or not so long as your phone continues to work. You don't care if there's radio waves. You're not going to go check into it. You're not going to go look into it. Oh, let me see how radio wave work. Oh, let me see how this box heats food if it's a microwave. You don't really care about that stuff. Why? It doesn't affect you. It stops working, it affects you. But that's the thing. Torah says that there are certain things that you don't see. Sometimes they affect you. Sometimes they don't affect you. Either way, you need to know about them. Why? For the few times that it does affect you. For the few times that it does affect you. So, a person that understands that this is very mysticism, or what they call mysticism, which for some of the sages, mysticism was like everyday life, is a very critical part of Judaism. It's not like some foreign teaching or, uh, or, or something that's on the outside. Now, to there are parts of the mystical that... It's forbidden to teach the public and even forbidden for most people to learn because this is called Kabbalah Ma'asit, which is above our pay grade, to say the least. It's doing certain things to deal with the mystical worlds and that can become very, very dangerous. Uh, so, I mean, I know uh, of a few people that went above their pay grade and they got in trouble for it. You know, one guy went crazy. You know, he's a mental institution. He was a serious, serious Talmud Chacham. A uh, few people were hurt by it. People think that, oh, no, I'm going to delve into Kabbalah, Rabbi. Most likely you're reading some Zohar Midrash, but you're calling it Kabbalah. It's not really Kabbalah. It's just a Midrash and a Zohar. The Zohar has many parts. In reality, if you're dealing with real Kabbalah, unless you're a serious Talmud Chacham, that's an expert in Shas, expert in Aruch, expert in Poskim, expert in, in, in all the major things that you are required to do. Expert, not just read it once. You're known as a Talmud Chacham. You're a person that's Kadosh, meaning the issues of, of Tikkun Abrit is not even relevant to you, Bechlal. Nothing. It's, you're, you're Kadosh. Unless you're that, you touch that stuff, you get hurt. You won't, you won't, it won't help you. And that's the problem. A lot of times people go into that, they try to go into that world and they Start becoming Meshubashim. Start becoming a little off. A little off. So, it's a... Uh, there is a lot more to this world. To answer your question in so many words, as you've noticed, uh, I'm a little bit long-winded, but there's a lot more to the world than you see. 
in this world, not just the next world, in this world. A lot more to it. Next. Almost done. One question, maybe, and we'll go. Yeah. Um, when it comes to business, let's say, um, let's say people do marketing or they are in a job and they may be involved with marketing. So if they're marketing something that may be like imagined or I encourage someone to do, so whether it's going or even could be a Jew, so are they allowed to do it if it's part of their job or is it just um, it's a bit of work? So, it, we, when we look at business and a person selling, we have to look at, you know, what the majority is. Who's the majority of the, of the customers? Who's the majority of the potential customers? Now, if a person uh, can choose, of course, it's ideal for a person to only choose kosher products, kosher food, kosher clothes, kosher everything. Of course, it's much better to do that. But if a person is part of their job, and let's say they work in non-kosher uh, clothing or non-kosher or other things. Now, if, the vast, if they're in a market where the majority of the people are not Jewish, then they're allowed to do it because the, you know, it's more likely that a non-Jew is going to buy from them. It's more likely that a non-Jew is going to buy from them whatever they're buying from them. Uh, somebody asked me a similar question about selling CBD online through uh, you know, multi-level marketing recently. Uh, CBD by, its, by default is, uh, is okay. It's, it's, if you use it as a medicine, it doesn't get you high. Of course, uh, you're not allowed to sell marijuana uh, unless you're a doctor and, or you're dealing with only sick people, not fake sick people. But CBD doesn't get you high. So people that are using it actually do want to get healthier. They don't want to get high. So by the, that is kosher. But the problem is what they do, they put CBD in certain non-kosher products. Like they'll put the CBD inside gummy bears. That are not kosher. That have uh, you know non-kosher uh, ingredients like gelatin, uh, that's from a pig or a horse bones or something like that. So you're not allowed to eat uh, non-kosher uh, uh, gummy bears or any type of gummy uh, candy. Or they'll put it in chocolate, or other types of or uh, muffins or whatever it is. So now those products you're not allowed to eat. Even if it has CBD in it, you're not allowed to eat it because they're not kosher food. You have another choice. You can use the oil or a pill or something like that that you're allowed to eat. But what about selling it? You're allowed to sell it because it's if you're if you're selling it in a market where the majority of the customers are not Jewish, and the market of the internet is eight billion people, the majority of them are not Jewish. You know, it's not if you. But on on the other hand, if you're gonna open a non-kosher, uh, let's say clothing store or food or whatever it is, uh, in a Jewish community, now you have a problem. Why? Because the majority of your customers are going to be Jewish. Now you have a serious problem. Now you have a serious problem. But if you're selling things online and, uh, or in certain parts of the uh, country or places where the majority of the people are not Jewish, then it's uh, not a problem. Not a problem. Ideally, you would go into a 100% kosher business, but it's not, again, that's a, uh, what's a allowed and what's recommended. A person needs to have a rough to tell them what's recommended, what's allowed. But generally speaking, again, it's a, uh, a person doesn't necessarily need to uh, um, be so stringent that they're, you know, they're doing more than the law and they can't handle it. You know, so if they, uh, if, if they are able to get a better job that doesn't require non-kosher uh, situations, of course that's ideal. But to be honest with you guys, the most non-kosher business today is almost every business. Why? Because the people are not kosher. Not the product. You could have people selling toys, books, sifre uh, Torah, tefillin, uh, food, all of which looks kosher, but the people are not kosher sometimes. They cheat in business, they don't pay people on time, they cheat the customers, all types of things. So make sure you don't work for a company like that. Make sure you don't work for a company that's cheating their customers, cheating their people, doesn't pay people on time, and so on. That's... I believe causes a lot more damage uh, than than people could imagine, simply because people think that uh, you know, as long as I'm uh, you know selling a kosher product, I can do whatever I want. No, there's rules to business. There's rules of how to do business. There's ethical rules. There's halachic rules. You can't do whatever you want. As a Jew, you have rules. Even as a non-Jew, you have rules, but much less. But as a Jew, you have rules. 
You have a lot of rules you have to comply with, and if you break them, it's a problem. Next. Anything else? No? Ruach HaKodesh and Siyad Dishmaya are worlds apart. Siyad Dishmaya is divine assistance. If a person prays to Hashem, a person who works in their emunah, their bitachon, does mitzvot and so on, and uh, prays to Hashem to help him, prays for Siyad Dishmaya, prays for divine assistance, that's not a problem. A, uh, in fact, the more bitachon they have in Hashem, the more they're giving Hashem to, to, a reason to help him. As the Pasuk says, Someone that has bitachon in Hashem, kindness will, be, will, uh, will go upon him. Meaning that Hashem helps a person just for having bitachon in him, needless to say, for doing mitzvot and so on. But Ruach HaKodesh, on the other hand, Ruach HaKodesh is a completely different level that you have to become a very, very pure person. Uh, and there is a shiur, actually, in a, I believe it's in the Perkei Avot series, where uh, I go over the instructions, the steps of what a person must do in order to attain Ruach HaKodesh. Um, and uh, is it possible to attain it? Yes. There are only few people in the world that maybe have it. Maybe. And that's not even a certainty. Um, in essence, Ruach HaKodesh is Hashem giving you insight on what He's thinking. You know, it's like almost prophecy. It's not prophecy quite, but it's almost. It's a uh, a different level of, uh, of 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 being. Now, can a person get to that? Sure. If he becomes a Ish Kadosh, he becomes Ish Kadosh. Both women and men that had Ruach Hakodesh have existed, but most people that say they have Ruach Hakodesh today are usually idol worshippers, or they're crazy people, or both. So it's a. Uh, Ruach HaKodesh is not something that an impure person would have, but can a Kadosh Baruch Hu give a person insights of certain things that are happening or certain feelings that uh, certain things that will happen or certain things that are happening? Yes, but that's not necessarily Ruach HaKodesh. That's Nitzot's Ruach HaKodesh. Like, you feel like such and such is going to call you. Two minutes later or that day, that guy calls you. You haven't talked to him in 20 years. You thought about him, but that day he called you. That's not Ruach HaKodesh. That's Nitzot. That's like a spark of Ruach HaKodesh. Spark. Ruach HaKodesh is mamash. Something out of this world. You should try it. But anyway, the uh, some people have... A Kadosh Baruch Hu gives them little tiny gifts for different reasons that he has. Uh, that a uh, person will have little Nitzotim, little sparks of Ruach HaKodesh. But real Ruach HaKodesh... Like on a regular basis, a person has to be kadosh, very kadosh, very very kadosh. That uh, takes a lot of Torah, a lot of mitzvot, uh, a lot, a lot. Uh, but uh, again, uh, person's number one concern should be to be righteous with Hashem, with or without ruach hakodesh, with or without anything. Why? You need to do it. It's good for you. If you do it, kadosh Baruch Hu will give you a lot of divine assistance. It'll give you so much siyat dishmaya, so much help, it might as well be Ruach HaKodesh. It might as well be Ruach HaKodesh. You know, but don't get crazy. Once you start seeing good things happen, don't start getting full of yourself. It's very easy to get full of yourself. It's very easy to think that you're righteous. It's very easy to think that you're like something special. Don't go there. Don't think of yourself as wicked, but don't think of yourself as uh, some tzaddik or some tzaddikah. It's not good. Always look at yourself in the middle. You're always in the middle. That's what the Rambam says. Always in the middle. You're not Rasha, you're not Tzaddik. You're in the middle. Why? The next action can change everything. If it's a sin, I become a Rasha. If it's a Mitzvah, I become a Tzaddik. Okay, but I did the Mitzvah. Okay, now you start again. Start again. You're back to 50. You're back to 50. 50%. 50%. Always, always. Always look at yourself in the middle. Don't look at yourself as wicked because you'll become depressed and lose all steam of doing Tshuva. But the same token, don't look at yourself as tzaddik and thinking that you're doing enough. There's always more to do. A lot of times people tell me, oh, listen, what else could I do to, uh, 
you know, to become better. Everything. That's the answer. Everything. Everything you're doing, you can do better. Yeah, but I'm already learning two hours a day. Learn four. Ah, it's too much. Oh, okay, there you go. So. But how? What? Hashem really expects me to learn. No, He actually expects me to learn more than four hours. I'm just being a little lenient on you because if I told you eight, nine, ten hours, you'd have a heart attack. So, let's try four. Let's try three. Let's try two and a half. Something. Person needs to know. Whatever. If you're alive, you could do a lot more. Sometimes people ask you, oh, what could I do for good things to happen to me? I'm sick. What could I do for me to get cured? I'm uh, poor. What could I do to get money? I'm uh, having problems. What can I do to have these problems? So you tell them, okay, let's do some uh, house cleaning. Are you modest? Eh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay, check. Uh, you keep Shabbat? Yeah, of course we keep Shabbat. What do you talk about in Shabbat? You know, work and things, check. Okay, kosher. You eat out, uh, the restaurants, everything? Yeah, you eat non-kosher restaurants? Only salad, check. Uh, your, your kids, which school does it go to? Oh, you know, they go to the Chabad center that has half the, uh, oh, you want the, one, you, the ones that has 50% of the Talmudim are uh, goyim, you mean? Yeah, but they're nice people. Check. Okay, so you're doing everything wrong. Your Shabbat's not Shabbat, you're talking about work. The school your kids are going to and they're going with goyim, forbidden complete. I don't care if it's called Chabad or it can be called Bet HaMikdash for all I care. Not allowed to go to school. Jews are not allowed to go to school with non-Jews. Why? They're something, we're something else. Yeah, but they're teaching Torah. doesn't make a difference. Why? You have intermarriage. Already over 80% in America. You want to increase the statistic with your kids too? So, school is wrong. Your Shabbat is wrong. Your kashrut, you eat, non- you eat uh, what, salads? At the non-kosher places? Okay, it's worse than eating pig. Why? Pig is one sin. The salad could be six. Why? Bugs. The goyim are not obligated to uh, clean their salads. They can eat their salads with the bugs in it. So you're eating salad at the non-kosher place, you're eating bugs. So your kashrut is not as good as you think. Your tzniut, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Your wig is longer than the exile. Your dress is tighter than your skin. Sometimes we can see your bones. Sometimes we actually can see some type of uh, organ, but we're not sure if it's the heart or the lungs. That's how tight it is. You have, no, you have no modesty at all. Modesty doesn't count when you're just sleeping under the covers. It's when you're out of sleep also. What does that mean? Start over. Throw out your clothes. Get some new clothes that are modest all the time. Not sometimes. Why? Sometimes... When you do mitzvot, sometimes, when you're sometimes modest, and you sometimes keep Shabbat, and you sometimes kosher, and you sometimes, what are you saying to Hashem? Sometimes I believe in you, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm a tzaddik, sometimes I'm an atheist. What do you think Hashem is going to say to you? Sometimes you be gay, no? Sometimes kavakela. Sometimes. Like Ben Gurion. Like Nachman Bialik also came in that same seance. They asked Nachman Bialik. Nachman Bialik told him, I'm in Kafakela 49 years. Why in Kafakela 49 years? He says, I'm preparing for Gainom. But why 49 years? How did they come up 49 years? Oh, one time for each time I committed adultery. One year in Kafakela, just to prepare me to go to Gainom. Rabbi Karim, what you don't see doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Does a person need to only focus on the scary stuff? No. You just need to know enough about it to keep you away from sin. Next time you have a Yetzirah, think, do I want this or no? Do I want this bad stuff to happen to me? No. Okay, let's go back to the books. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. doesn't matter if you don't feel like it. Do you feel like going to Gainom? You feel like going to Kafakela? You feel like being some hot dog like the guy that was going against the Satmi Rebbe? No, right? Okay, so go learn some Torah. Go learn some Torah. I promise you, you're going to feel like it. When? In Gan Eden. You're going to feel like it a lot. You're going to feel like it a lot. In Gan Eden, you're going to say, Hashem, I felt like it. Why? I arrived at Gan Eden. Thank you for asking some interesting questions. Bezat Hashem, tomorrow, uh, next week, we're going to continue our uh, shiur, our uh, series of uh, Jewish ideology, Ashkafa Yudit, on uh, Sunday night, Bezat Hashem. Again, as a reminder for anyone that wants to order the... Uh, 
uh, posters. Uh, you go to the website, bezatashem.org. You can order in the store. I actually have some in my car for anyone that wants to give out. Uh, but uh, the CDs, uh, where uh, anyone that wants to order, it's on the website also. But we are looking for a distribution company that will do a uh, one-day uh, giveaway. Uh, so if you know anybody that's in the distribution business and knows what they're doing, please let me know. Uh, we're going to try to give them out as soon as possible because anima amin be munash lema that this is the trufa. I believe with complete emuna that this is the cure. Cure for Corona, cure for Am Yisrael. We just got to print enough. So we got to start with this and we got to give it out as soon as possible. Ba'uch Adonai Amen ve'amen.